going to introduce myself and time myself. <laughs> uh, thank you for reconciling the idea of uh, islands with ecosystemic thinking. Uh, so I'm going to present, um, it's going to be a simple presentation. I'm going to and also want to welcome some of our students from, from GSD that are joining us from, from Cambridge. Um, I'm going to present uh, what I think are some influence, uh, at least influences for me, and, and, and the reason for, for present this work is because on the one hand I think this is one of the hardest uh, aspects to trace in the practices like mine that have been interested in, in landscape, um, but also because it's actually a work in progress, the act of tracing these influences. And then I'm going to explain uh, briefly some projects that have close proximity to these influences, but that were also competitions that were not or originally meant to be landscapes. So I'm going to start with this image that it's, actually I couldn't find a better image. I took this photograph in Sao Paulo some years ago when I visited and I discovered the work of, uh, of Sergio Bernardes, which um, is an architect that I think was born in uh, 1909, uh, contemporary of Oscar Niemeyer, and who is, I think, one of the people that, one of the designers that I think we should be really looking at when we try to retrace this history of uh, ecological thinking uh, and, but also territorial design. This is, as you see, a project in a single image. This is the whole country of Brazil. Uh, these are a series of cities uh, with distances of 400 kilometers in between them and each one defines an aqueduct. And he basically proposed this idea as part of um, a laboratory that he called the Laboratory for Conceptual Investigations in Brazil at that time, uh, in which they, he was basically speculating about cities, about an architecture, but, uh, but also about the difficulties and the complexities of uh, literally colonizing a country so large. So this project was also basically uh, an alternative to the, of course, the centralized model of Brasilia. Sergio Bernardes, again, uh, this project has been extremely influential uh, for me, for many projects. Uh, you see the balloon, but also you see a, a garden by Roberto Burle Marx. So this is for the um, 1958 uh, um, exhibition in, in, in Belgium. So this, of course, predates uh, the work of Kulhas. I wouldn't be so surprised if he already knew about this. Um, it was a project in which this balloon was meant to be not only uh, a beacon for the pavilion, but also a way to, to basically transform that space into a courtyard uh, and, and design in coordination with, uh, with this tropical garden that was exported and, and designed by, by Roberto Burlemar. So it's a building. Uh, it's about this contained garden, but also about this um, uh, fl floating structure. The way to draw has also been quite... Uh, influential. Uh, this is some more, some more images of the pavilion. So again, this is a very particular uh, mind that somehow, and I'm looking forward to have this conversation in, in Brazil, has been somehow uh, forgotten. Uh, many people do not know it. It's a bit uh, difficult to find information in, in English and in Spanish um, about his work. And in part, and, and this is uh, something that I think we should really think about, is work that was happening at the same time that the country, particularly Brazil, was urbanizing fast, and, and work that had uh, um, a certain side of speculation was somehow not as visible, of course, as the, the work of contemporaries, like, of course, uh, Oscar Niemeyer and all these other figures, like uh, Lucio Costa, for example, in, in, in Rio de Janeiro. So I think it's fair to say that this was happening when Rio de Janeiro was literally one of the, was the center of the world in terms of uh, art and, and design. Um, but also this image that could be, uh, this is one of the, house, the houses he designed. He designed many houses in, in Brazil in which the, even the heights of certain sections were not so much influenced by, by, of course, influenced by, by tropical modernism, but also had direct connections with cert certain geographic events that were actually quite, quite distant. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, spin on the tropical modernity, and, and I think it's quite um, important for look at it. Or even in projects that you wouldn't think as projects about openness or porosity, like a vertical tower, um, 
like the like this speculative project for the for Casa Alta in in Brazil. Moving to arts, I think the what what Camilo show was really interesting, but I think also certain things have happened in Colombian art that has been quite influential for for us, certainly for me. This is by Rodrigo Callejas, my father. This is 1972. Uh, Super Studios Continuous Monument was uh, 1969, I think. So this is three years of separation. A Colombian artist, he was not the only one, uh, probably looking at the same people, so maybe the same reference. By no means, I'm not trying to say that he predated Super Studios, but maybe, I don't know. In any case, this was a moment in which Colombian art was clearly connected with a, with a network that was quite global. Or this sculpture, also part of his work, uh, also from that time, that is basically an abstraction of the mountains and the, and the representation of the atmosphere and the air as, as neon. Uh, work by Silvia Mojica. Uh, this is, of course, I'm allowing myself to also be a bit autobiographical because Latins were very good at that, but also because it's just necessary in this case where it's difficult to trace the influence. Painting by Silvia Mojica, uh, my mother, that was obsessed for... Uh, almost 30 years into representing the plants without showing any kind of context, no sky, no context, and focusing on how the light could be a manifestation of the weather outside. So basically, uh, what I remember more clearly that was also the part that was more influential is the plant as individual and the painting about the plant, not being about the individual really, but actually the, the context around it and how it could be able to reflect from pure white to certain types of green. So basically an obsession particularly with, with poems. Um, the work of uh, Grupo Utopia that I want to acknowledge, but also because we really tried to have them here, but they are in, in Paris. Um, an extremely influential work, I think, for at least for many of us, because not only deal with questions about the city and urbanism, but also a hybrid practice that deal that somehow that intersections between art and, and, and architecture. Uh, but also work that was clearly, uh, that you could clearly connect to that lineage of uh, Super Studio and with not too much time difference. Um, this is work that I, it's also extremely difficult to track. There was a really interesting exhibition a couple of years ago, but I think we should really tar start to pay more, more attention to that work. This is more of the work of uh, Group Utopia. Always questions about the city, about the speculation and through the lens of art. Um, my own work uh, uh, dealing with photography, I, I got to landscape through, really through representation. I think representation and landscape are inseparable, really. In my case, not through painting, but through photography, and to starting to hunt certain landscape that for me could be um, ways to, 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 to basically be able to, to decontextualize certain conditions to photography. Uh, to use in drawings, but also to, as, as, uh, to use certain formal strategies. And as that, for example, that it's uh, the past one, a dam in Iceland, the second largest dam in, in Europe, or the, uh, one of the ocean pools in, in Australia. This is the one called the icebergs, anonymous architecture. Um, a seawall in Japan. Uh, so basically, the, this series of photographs that I've been uh, collecting not only end up in the drawings, that I would say is 50% of those photographs, but in many cases, those really large scale objects and geometries end up finding their way in, uh, in becoming the actual projects. So it's a very direct translation from the act of traveling to collecting those landscapes and literally using those, uh, those elements at multiple scales. So from that seawall in, in Japan, in the island of uh, Naoshima, to the simple boardwalk in, uh, in Iceland. Always with a lot of attention to the, to the context and the atmosphere of those uh, settings. The translations of those photographs, uh, at least for me, and this is probably one of, the, one of the reasons I jumped into landscape, has been instinctively from the beginning. Uh, through the plan as projection. So the plan as a projection that allows you to jump through scales and, and basically uh, these are 100 drawings or 48 competitions that I've done since 2008. 
And, and I'm going to start with, it's a project that I've never shown in a lecture. I don't know how this is going to go. It's actually the first project that I ever did. This is when I started to work with, um, with Edgar Maso and, and Sebastián Mejía as, as part of Paisajes Emergentes. And this is before the competition of the pools. We got this really strange commission <laughs> of uh, the, the theater festival in Bogota uh, commissioned us to design a stage for, for puppets in what it's a really huge parking lot in Corferias. It's an event venue in Bogota, one of the largest in, in Colombia. So this is a parking lot. This is a 10 meter grid. And we had something like 1.5 million pesos, so less than $1,000 to basically affect that, that site. But we also found quite uh, uh, difficult to, to, to work in a place that was completely enclosed when we started and we wanted to have an office to deal with questions of landscape. So it was really, but also it's the project that we started to think how could we introduce ideas about landscape in this case in the extreme containment of a, of a parking lot. So uh, many of you here are familiar with this plastic material that is used for, for the flower cultures that you see around the city everywhere. We use that plastic as a way to, to replicate uh, basically a foggy day, like, like the ones that we are having now in, in Medellin that are quite strange. So, and, and basically that as a setting, uh, it was basically the decontextualization of certain photographs that we did in, in, in the coast of Colombia where uh, in, in, in very foggy coast as a way to create uh, a backdrop for those, uh, for those puppets. Um, using simply the, the forest of columns of the of the, of the parking lot. This is the, um, moving now to the aquatic center in, in Medellin. This is a project that many of you know. I'm, I'm going to try to show you some of the uh, other influence, or let's say not so obvious influences of that project. Uh, um, as you know, we, we, we were three partners, Edgar Maso, Sebastian Mejia, and myself. And, and, and I was really interested in this. This is, uh, this, incredible network of ocean pools in, in Australia, in Sydney. There are more than this, it's 20 something ocean pools. And while I was looking at the geometry and the setting of these pools, mostly designed by engineers, some quite precarious, some others defined with concrete. Uh, um, Edgar particularly and Sebastian were looking into architecture that more or less resembled that. So I think in that productive uh, conversation, some ideas about geometry and, and landscape became, became quite important. So. Uh, in short, we were looking at the same time as CISA pools, which are, of course, a masterpiece of landscape integration, not landscape architecture, and the pools in, in, in Australia, basically the anonymous pieces of, uh, of, of, of public infrastructure. So I do believe that if this gave us some of the, let's say, architectural language for the project as a precedent, the pools in Australia, at, at least for me, gave me a clue about the geometric variations of some of the, of some of the walls. And, and this is really what we always thought that we wanted in Medellin, a city 400 kilometers from the sea. So in a way, our, our job was a lot more complicated than CISA's job. Uh, the landscape is there already, and it's about landscape integration. In our case, what about the, the reconstruction of an ocean 400 kilometers from the, from the sea? So it's a, it's a big, big problem. Uh, the brief was quite strange. Some of you probably did that competition and remember that the, the brief smelled as if it was based on the Beijing Aquatic Center, probably because it was very close to, to those games. So it was a brief that probably wanted a, a contained environment and a building for pools, as they usually are. But Medellin, as you, as you know, and it's a, it's a city in the middle of the Andes. Uh, with a constant temperature where you don't really need uh, a building to, to contain uh, uh, a professional swimming facility. So usually open air swimming facilities are for recreation while the covered ones are the professionals. We really wanted to push the idea that in a city like Medellin, the tropical belt, you will be able to have an, a scenario for swimming that could be used professionally still getting rid of the walls and the roof. This is the valley, and, and this is probably interesting also for some of my students that are here, just to understand that flatness is an exception and not a rule, which makes the horizontality of an operation like that uh, more special. And, and other issues, like simply 
it, it rains a lot in, in Medellin. Well, not, not these days, but uh, it usually rains a lot. So, so maybe the proximity to the ocean could be manifested or that connection could be, even if it was just heuristic with, with the cycles of rain and, and the selection of certain plants. But first it started with those collage and those photographs and, and it was really about a fiction. It was really about swimming in water surrounded by more water. And, and in a way, it was an impossible project that managed to, to seduce the jury into thinking that this could be a park-like professional swimming facility. And the indeterminacy of those pools uh, was yet to be defined, but, but that had the potential to be a landscape. But it was necessarily to communicate it with that level of abstraction in a context in which uh, landscape was still, I think, as a, as a conversation, still nascent. So, um, that's what I, I, I really like Brigitte's comment about no context because the work is, has been, in that case, I remember criticized for that. And questions about what are those pools and the mosquitoes and all that were there. But at the same time, we were always struggling in finding uh, an alternative, which of course had to happen in, in coordination with, with a lot of people that help us, among them biologists and and, and, and plant designers. Uh, Andres Ospina worked with us in this, in, this, in this project. But whatever these gardens will be, the system was going to be the same, which is a system of pool, courtyard, pool, courtyard, and the, and, and the garden always surrounding the, 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 the geometries of the pools and the geometries of the, of the courtyards. So that was for us the landscape that we really, and I call it landscape because different than CISA, we really had to create it from scratch. For CISA, the landscape was there already. Um, drawings attempting to, you can see the level of uh, naiveness in the drawing uh, as we didn't know exactly what we were planting at that time. And we were finding it along the way uh, during the design of the process. But because that was so undetermined, that pushed us to have a very rigid and, 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 and quite deterministic geometry that will be able to contain either water or plants or grasses. Uh, they will be able to be overgrown or, or simply completely die as they are dead today because it's not raining. We went today <laughs> and I told uh, Charles and Helen when we went that the gardens are at their worst right now. So <laughs> it's interesting because these gardens then become simply a, a mirror of what's happening. Uh, this is on a normal Medellin day when we have around 100 days of rain a year. So when they are grown like that, they act as room, so they block some of the views. And, and this street, as, as some of you know, is meant to, in, in the case of a good administration, is meant to be open, so somehow replace the sidewalk outside. And then these uh, excavations will be able to, to give some degree of uh, privacy and intimacy to competitors that don't necessarily want to be in a park-like situation. And, and, and the operation basically of the excavation allowed us to have uh, yeah, some degree of building-like condition in a project that wasn't really asking for it in the, in the first place. Um, the only building that emerges from that, uh, from that datum is the, the, the stands. The, the only one that we consider was worth keeping as a, as, a, as a kind of vertical extrusion to be able to watch Really the only sport that we think had a, a decent audience, the synchronized swimming, also because it's simply quite beautiful as a, as a dance. So more than a sport, we, we saw it as a landscape as well. And uh, the constraints of the site were uh, incredibly tough. I forgot to say Sebastian worked in this project. <laughs> you worked really hard on this. Uh, this was, uh, it was complicated. So, as, as you know, these are the old pools. This is uh, a project that needed renovations. The administration decided to keep the two sets of stands. So geometrically, we had a, a complicated condition that, that somehow wasn't too flexible, simply because you cannot change the geometry of the pools. The pools are pools, they are squares. And, and the garden somehow had to deal with that. So that geometry that is seemingly a bit overcomplicated was actually a way to negotiate the geometry of the, of the rectangles and the squares and the odd shape of the, of, the, of the site that we were given. The excavations were meant always to, um, and this, my, my uh, former partner Edward, Edgar was obsessed with that, with this idea that the walls could become 
uh, almost like vertical extensions of these gardens. And, and if left uh, unkept, some of the moss will invade those cracks. And so all the detailing was basically meant to intensify that. Um, I always like to think that the detailing is quite raw and that the, that the only details that we really have are to incentivize some kind of uh, landscape condition. I'm going to move fast. Um, I'm going to skip this one that Charles showed. <laughs> so it's basically the, the master plan for the Olympics. And I'm going to switch to a project that I did. Um, was the first project once we, um, uh, when, when I started the new practice and, and, and when I was looking into other mediums for landscape, in this case water and air, um, I was interested in, in the manifestation of air and, as water and, and looking at these experiments by, by, by Humboldt that were basically experiments that were trying to determine uh, whether the air is water and how much humidity there is in the air and developing this uh, very basic uh, tool, uh, the cyanometer. And, and this was connected with a competition that, that happened in Montreal. Uh, this is a city in, in Canada. Some of you know uh, it's a city that eats water. It's, uh, it's quite snowy. Uh, it, it's an island also. And, and there was a competition very strange to connect the airport with the city center and to design some kind of landscape without the budget of a landscape. So it was meant to be an scenography. So some kind of welcoming to the, to the city. So the idea was to intensify uh, certain uh, qualities that could be manifested as blue color and uh, at very different scales. So the interventions range from collecting all the snow in a single pile rather than in many piles and created a large pile that would take longer to melt, all the way to changing all the windows, all the glass of all the buildings that face the airport so that you will see these blue reflections as you approach the city. So yeah, that, that blue glass that we all hate, that the one that we wanted to install in the, in the buildings, but facing a single, uh, as a, a single direction. So it was basically uh, a, a, a simple exercise about, yeah, basically the, the landscape as, as how it is perceived from the road and how it can be manifested in, 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 in different colors. In the container, uh, deposits, for example, we will keep some containers freeze there, the ones that fray the road, freeze the road and, and, and paint them in different shades of blue. So these will be containers that wouldn't move and will become the, the wall of the, of the container park. These are some detail, well, not really details, some diagrams of the, of the idea of changing some of the glass of the, of the, of the buildings. But really the document that, that led this process was the plan. So it's a plan in which different interventions were inserted. This is uh, 17 kilometers. It's a 17 kilometer drive. And, and as you can see, the drawings are very raw. This is when the team was uh, just me. And, uh, and, and so there was not, it was not even possible to do 3D. So these are all being images with, with simple uh, Photoshop collage. This is a project that I did very recently with, with Giancarlo Masanti. Uh, um, I think this is the strangest competition that has happened in Colombia in many years. This is a competition for designing a, a greenhouse in the tropics. It's, it's a strange uh, idea. Uh, it's in Bogota. Bogota is a cold city, of course. But many of the species that you will have on a greenhouse, even in Bogota, you can have in an open air condition for most part of the year. And all you need is some degree of protection, but you don't need really the glass building that is basically a um, a colonial idea. It's an idea that have about basically Northern European, particularly German, Swedish, about uh, basically having a contained paradise. So and English were very fond of this idea too, which is basically to take tropical plants there and have them exhibit and do whatever architecture it takes to keep them alive. So that competition happened in Bogota. And from that moment, we were interested in somehow uh, fighting a little bit this idea that, that this is an extremely uh, bourgeois concept, this idea of having uh, a building for, for tropical plants. And in the tropic, that would be even more complicated. And, but, but they're also, of course, quite beautiful. And we, we were also fascinated by them and, and just simply acknowledging the fact that these crystal palaces as a type are also extremely uh, 
interesting. Uh, they are halfway between a, a garden and a, and a, and a palace, and, 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 and there's some architecture there that we were interested in as well. So as Camilo was showing this image that is becoming also a kind of a, of a cliche of, a, of, of what we are, is instrumental because in Bogota we're actually quite close to these zones. And we were starting to do studies about the plants that were asking the brief. We realized that 80% of those plants actually not, don't need that building. They need some degree of protection, more like a blanket rather than a glass house. And, and there has been, through history, other techniques to do that. Uh, but probably you have seen these tents that you can buy in northern Europe to cover your Mediterranean tree in the winter. And, uh, and we were interested in decontextualizing that. Some of them are textile and using some of the most basic architectural principles of the palaces as a way to construct uh, um, basically what we thought was a, a kind of collage of what the history of greenhouses has been. In terms of construction, we were interested also in some of the principles of, uh, of the more unusual uh, palaces for plants like this one. So complete prefabrication and, and, and easy assemblage, but also, again, the work of Bernardes. Uh, in this case, I think Giancarlo was more looking into Stan Allen, and I was looking at Bernardes, and, and maybe just putting this horizontally, these ideas that, uh, and that are also easy to connect with, with, with some example for Northern uh, uh, Europe, could be useful to understand that some parts of this building can be open, some parts can be closed, and the ones that are closed can also, doesn't necessarily have to be hard, they can be soft. Uh, and some of these trees could somehow uh, behave in the same way as the field of the structure behaves. So uh, it's still a competition with a brief. They ask for different rooms, uh, so one for the jungle, one for the desert, one for the, what they call the utilitarian plant, what Camilo was describing, plants that have a function or that have been determined that have some kind of interest, whether it's uh, ethnographic or simply for food. And so these are the rooms as given by the competition that we decided to organize in this way, not because we wanted a typical courtyard, because we weren't imagining that in a good day in Bogota, which is actually not rare to have 21 degrees Celsius in Bogota, or even 25 in a really good day, you can open up all those curtains and have this fantasy garden for real that you couldn't be able to have in a greenhouse in the north of Europe, which could be to have a horizontal view of all these uh, gardens that were meant to be separated because the brief was based on, in, in, of, in, in that kind of, uh, of, of thinking. So the drawings uh, were basically meant to show that, uh, talking a little bit about representation and interest in, in showing the plant as individual and unit with more or less the same intensity of, as some of the, let's say, more structural elements or harder elements of the building as a way to also help dissolve the perception of these uh, of this piece, and this curtain that at that time we, we, we thought was probably PVC, the best way to do it, that could be able to open and close these gardens depending on the temperature outside. And, uh, and of course, some diagrams and drawings that we were trying to do, trying to prove it that will actually uh, work. But what I really believe about this project, if, even if the science of that wouldn't have been possible to, to, to refine in the competition process. The, the tropics, as I think Brigitte was describing quite well, are actually resilient enough so the science doesn't have to be so precise. So in many cases, we have a quite big advantage to landscape projects that, were, that are done in, in the north, in, in the United States on, or in Europe, which is that we have a little bit of a margin when we are working with other professionals to determine certain environmental conditions of the building work, because simply, well, maybe two or three will die or will not grow as much, but, uh, but it's not like the main ideas of the building or the landscape will, will, will collapse. Thank you.